Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on Erasure by Percival Everett. This book was published about 20 years ago. Uh, and it's an absolutely marvelous book. It's a brilliant satire. It's incisive. It's very, very funny, but it's brutally funny. It's a devastating book. Uh, Everett draws on his, his career at this point. He had published over a dozen books when he wrote this. Uh, so he draws on his career. He draws on his deep appreciation for literature, both classical literature, uh, literary criticism, the African-American, the black classics, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, Zora Neale Hurston, Jean Toomer. He draws on all of those influences. Uh, and he produces something that is stunning. It, it is a, a marvelous book, uh, but it's a book that, that demands attentive reading and is going to cause the reader to, to question uh, our own motives. He, in, in a sense, we are not simply reading the book. We are also part of uh, the question in the book that Everett is asking. He's, he's asking questions of readers of popular fiction, readers of literary fiction, and, and the way that we think about the text that we're interacting with, the way that we, we think about a writer's identity or uh, uh, presume about a writer's identity. And so it is an absolutely marvelous book, but it is, is breathtakingly funny. Uh, there, there are passages in here, there are characterizations in here that are, that are just <laughs> so brutal and, and an absolute slap in the face of people in real life. Uh, and yet Everett you know, merits that with the way that he, he holds a mirror up to our culture, to, to the culture of readers, uh, to the culture in the US and, and in the, the world at large, and asks some, some very serious questions. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I know Everett has sort of been seeing a number of these books republished in the aftermath of his, his marvelous success with The Trees. And this was a book that was, I think at one point, um, uh, garnering some attention, uh, but not in the way that The Trees did. And it's, it's going to be, it's, it's been adapted, it'll soon be released as American fiction. Uh, but, but there are ways in which I think the book accomplishes something through the use of text in a very fascinating, interesting way. Um, so briefly, we're introduced to Monk Ellison, uh, Thelonious Monk Ellison. And, and that's very crucial because right away we get these twin totems of black culture. We have Thelonious Monk, the jazz pianist, and we also have Ralph Ellison, the brilliant novelist, uh, the writer of Invisible Man and Juneteenth. Um, <coughs> and so... Uh, Everett is sort of using those as, as, as crucial names as he starts the book. And so Monk Ellison is sort of frustrated. He's, he's a professor of literature. He writes periodically. And we, we get an example of his criticism and the, the highfalutin academic jargon that he, that he possesses as a, a critic, as a professor of literature. Uh, but we also see how he's, he's frustrated commercially. His books aren't particularly successful. He does these interesting, they sound quite interesting and perhaps are based on Everett's work in the uh, 1980s and the 1990s, uh, where there are retellings of plays by Aeschylus or Euripides. And there's this deep reader and, and the works he's producing, these retellings of classical literature, uh, so classic you haven't even heard of it because it's before the 19th century. Um, and that, that's the type of, of author that he seems. He's a serious writer, he's academic. Um, we have a very, very funny scene at the beginning where he talks about uh, arriving at the conference and uh, he, he says that one reviewer, um, he goes, the novel is finely crafted with fully developed characters, rich language and subtle play with the pop plot. But one is lost to understand what this reworking of Aeschylus, the Persians has to do with the African-American experience. One night at a party in New York, one of the tedious affairs where people who write mingle with people who want to write and with people who can help either group begin or continue to write, a tall, thin, rather ugly book agent told me that I could sell many books if I'd forget about writing retellings of Euripides and parodies of French post-structuralists and settle down to write the true, gritty, real stories of black life. I told him that I was living a black life, far blacker than he could ever know, that I had lived one, that I would be living one. He left me to chat with an on-the-rise performance artist novelist who had recently posed for 17 straight hours in front of the governor's mansion as a lawn jockey. He familiarly flipped one of her braided extensions and tossed a thumb back in my direction. And we see uh, Ellison, not ever, but Ellison, the character's frustrations with uh, being pigeonholed. He's a very serious writer, but people only want to take him seriously when they, they, they focus on one aspect of his identity as a writer. Uh, and, and so we see that. We see his interactions with his sister, who's a doctor in Baltimore, uh, uh, and who, who works with a, a women's clinic. And the violence, the, the danger she faces on a daily and weekly basis from picketers. There's a mention early on that, that someone has you know, shot 
at one of the doctors at one of these hospitals. And then that mirrors very much the, the, the past few years of what we've seen with healthcare in the US and women's healthcare here in the US. Um, and this was, as I said, written 20 years ago, but Everett's tapping into all of these ideas. And, and he's very incisive in, in the way that he's analyzing our culture. Um, but as the book transpires, and there are events that happen that I don't want to spoil, but uh, Ellison ultimately, in his frustration, decides to write a parody of the authentic, you know, novel about uh, the black experience in the U.S. And uh, he titles it My Pathology. It's written by Stag R. Lee, which is a, a, a reference to, you know, to sort of an almost folk hero, Stag Lee. <laughs> and I'll put a link to one of those uh one of those songs in the description box below. But we get the full text of my pathology and there's all these misspellings. There's um, what David Foster Wallace and other grammarians had characterized as standard black English. Uh, that, that's the, the language that's used throughout the text. Each chapter is misspelled. So seven is seven, eight is chapter eight is spelled as A-T-E, things like this. Uh, that uh, when, it's, when, when he finishes the work, he sends it off and his his uh agent is sort of like people are going to be offended if the, if they read this and he uh ellison says they should be offended like this is this work is a piece of satire and yet it's interesting to see then how my pathology which later gets retitled as just a profanity is picked up and run with and 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 ever it lets us see that sort of this side of literary culture of writers and reviewers and book awards and, and how a book can be chosen to be on a talk show or something uh, to, to, to become a very popular book or even adapted. And so we see all of these ways in which so many power brokers uh, only want to view Ellison's life and Ellison's uh, creativity through a very narrow uh, prism and how, how he is gonna react to all of these things. But the, so the, the book is fascinating in terms of the, the structure, the metafictional layers, the way that we get examples of his his criticism, the actual full text of my pathology, the transcript of like an interview, um, little stories that drop in and out. But it, it's a devastating book. It, when he finishes this long paper uh, that's extraordinarily academic, <laughs> it references French critics and such. It was when I was done, there was a tentative smattering of applause and then a nerve dulling silence while people tried to figure if they were offended or why. As I stepped back toward my seat, a ball of keys flew past my head and hit the flocked wallpaper. I looked into the audience to find Davis Gimbel, the editor of a journal called Frigid Noir. Gimbel shook his fist in the air and shouted, you bastard. I could tell immediately that he hadn't understood a word of what I had read. His reaction seemed inappropriate and extreme, but he was eager to appear as though comprehension had come quickly to him. Linda Mallory was in the audience and we shared a look. She indicated with a nod that she thought my paper was all right and offered a single quiet continued applause. I picked up Gimbel's keys and tossed them back to him. You'll no doubt need these, I said. These words, too, were taken as an insult, and Gimbel, a man who fancied himself a kind of Hemingway, moved toward me as if to fight. He was restrained quickly by his entourage, a changing but constant stable of four young, aspiring writers who would evaporate and be replaced by the next crop. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, Gimbel, I said. I could already tell that the session was going to be the talk of the meeting, that it was going to take on a life of its own and become the kind of thing these talentless puds thrived on. Which part bothered you most? You, you mimetic hack, Gimbel spat at me. A mimetic hack, I repeated his words. Okay. I glanced at the door and saw people already bolting for the outside, where they would offer their versions of the fight and say, I was sitting right next to Gimbel when it all started, or I couldn't believe it when Ellison hurled the keys right back at him. Anyway, I left the room, everyone giving me a wide berth. Out of fear or reverence, I could not tell. He later uh, refers to that character and, and his coterie as intellectually homeless academics. Uh, but throughout the book, we also have these meditations from Ellison, the, the narrator, on the nature of words or on language, the, the, these really deep reflective passages. It's incredible that a sentence is ever understood, mere sounds strung together by some agent attempting to mean something, but the meaning need not and does not confine itself to that intention. Those sounds, strung as they are in their peculiar and particular order, never change, but they do nothing but change. Even if grammatical recognitions are crude, meaning is present. Even if the words are utterly confusing, there is meaning. Even if the semantic relationships are only general or categorical, even if the language is unknown. Meaning is internal, external, orbital, but still there is no such thing as propositional content. 
Language never really effaces its own present, but creates the illusion that it does in cases where meaning presumes a first priority. And he follows it up with, a metaphor cannot be paraphrased. Um, and, and throughout, we get these tiny glimpses of just the deep intellect that the character Ellison possesses. And of course, by extension, that certainly Everett possesses that intellect. And it's ignored. It's, it's completely glossed over because of the, the type of language he uses in his novels, that he's not being celebrated um, for, for revealing this, this misery or this um, experience of coming up through poverty or something that he, he admits very openly, my father was a, a doctor, you know, my sister is a doctor, my brother is a doctor. Like I had a very affluent, productive life and education. I didn't have those experiences. And yet we see the tiny ways in which he has dealt with racism throughout his past, even with his affluent um, experiences. We see how he continues to, to, to you know, wrestle with the world he lives in and the, the culture of uh, violence, frankly, that he lives in and how he views that. At one point, we get this fascinating uh, memory of his father because what we see is that Ellison's mother's uh, memory is starting to, to weaken her grasp on, on, on you know, their, their shared reality is very tenuous. Uh, and and there's, his sister has been taking care of the mother, but he, he needs to now take on some responsibilities with helping as well. And so we're seeing all of these different shifts, revelations about his family and, and their, those shared relationships occur throughout the book. Uh, and, and those can be very fascinating in terms of characterization, but there's also this brilliant moment where the young Ellison is asked by their father to talk about his paper on Finnegan's Wake that he wrote in college. And he goes, well, you don't actually read it, I said. You look at it for a long time, but you don't really read it. And the dad laughs. My point exactly. He laughed and drank some wine. He offered a nudge of his elbow toward Lisa as if to include her. Okay, I said, this is what I wrote in my paper. I looked at mother and my siblings and felt sick, like I had been seduced into slitting their throats. I looked at my father's excited eyes. In spite of the obvious exploitation of alphabetic and lexical space in the wake, and in spite of whatever typographical or structural gestures one might focus on, the most important feature of the book is the way it actually conforms to conventional narrative. The way it layers using such devices is metaphor and symbol. What's different is that each sentence, each word calls attention to the devices. So the work really reaffirms what it seems to expose. It is the thing it is, perhaps twice, and depends on the currency of conventional narrative for its experimental validity. Father looked at me for a long time. He then looked at his other two children and put his fork down. I hope before you go to bed this evening, you kiss your brother. Then he stood and left the table. And the memory is, is crucial, it's devastating, what it spells for Monk's relationship to his sister Lisa, his brother uh, Bob, Bill. <laughs> and so those relationships are crucial, but whatever it is saying about Finnegan's weight could equally be applied to his own work, especially something as explicitly metafictional, as deliberately postmodern um, as this satire is. And so the, the, the work as a whole, as I said, is just consistently asking these questions, interrogating a reader. Why are we laughing at particular scenes? How do we react when we read my pathology? When you're confronted with a text that, that is deliberately using, you know, standard black English or uh, using the N word repeatedly, how does a reader, you know, wrestle with that text? What do you think of it? Um, and and how, how, you know, is that what we seek out for when we think of, you know, black classics? What, what is that? And so Everett is, is just consistently interrogating every reader of this book, and yet he continues to, uh, to just really wrap it up in a fascinating way. I, I really recommend this book. It was um, one my wife and I read together, and so we really enjoyed discussing it, digging in, asking, you know, sending messages to each other as we were reading it, but then talking about it each night over the course of a week. So I, I highly recommend this. If you enjoyed The Trees, or I'm Not Sydney Poitier, uh, So Much Blue, it, this is just a very, very good book uh, that I think points the way towards what Everett has been producing throughout this entire century. So highly recommend it. Uh, certainly, it's the my pathology in particular is deeply influenced by Richard Wright's Native Son. That's a seminal text. Um, I'll link my videos uh, on Native Son in the description box. Invisible Man uh, is a huge reference. There are ways in which Monk as he becomes Stagley, views himself as a Reinhardt, uh, an explicit reference to Ellison, and of course, the title character's name. Um, 
The another work I was reminded of was Philip Roth's Zuckerman Bound novels. So the Ghost Rider, Zuckerman Unbound, the Anatomy Lesson, I think uh, the Prague Orgy, the way that Roth was taking sort of his own experiences as a writer, someone who's had success but hasn't has also had some failure, has created scandals within his community of Jewish Americans. <coughs> and uh, the, the the very close to close to heart um, nature nature of, of these books, I think, is very close to what Everett accomplishes. Everett goes in for some very different uh, types of writing, and, and I think the, the postmodern layers are, are uh, much more deliberate, much more formal than what Roth did, but, but I think they're very comparable. Certainly, <coughs> the influence of Aeschylus or Euripides, the references to those writers is, is crucial. Um, Jonathan Swift and his satires is, is one of the best. Um, but another black satirist who, who sort of is, a, is another bridge between the black classics of the 20th century and a writer like Percival Everett would, I think, be Ishmael Reed, who's still, you know, alive. Uh, and Mumbo Jumbo would probably be my favorite among his works. Um, someone like uh, Black No More by George Schuyler. Uh, during the Harlem Renaissance was asking these same deep questions around um, black identity and sat using satire to expose facets of racism within our culture. Within the book, uh, Ellison meets a, a young mother who's reading uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God and is uh, aware of Jean Toomer's cane and talks with her about these and then is encouraging her, you know, oh, you know, are, have, have you taken college classes? You you would belong in a college. And she sort of laughs dismissively and says, like, I, you know, I never graduated from high school. And that acts as another way that he starts to hold up that mirror to the culture and the mirror to himself as he's producing then my pathology. Uh, the idea of satire of sort of the literati. I thought of Thomas Bernhard's uh, Woodcutters, certainly. And then finally, if you're a fan of Ralph Ellison, <coughs> I would highly encourage you to read Juneteenth. I'll link my video in the description box on that. Uh, or grab the full, all versions of the text in three days before the shooting. It's one of the great titles. It's, it's sad that that work was never published with that title, because that's dynamite. But let me know. Let me know if you have a favorite book from Percival Everett. And I, I will be looking forward to seeing how the erasure is adapted in American fiction. My wife and I are both looking forward to that. So I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you.